Today, I got a very special guest here with me. Someone who's always been with me through thick and thin, health and sickness, and not even death will do us part. Please welcome my best friend, mentor, and the greatest fear in human history. Death! Wow. What happened to all the applauses I was expecting? It's okay. I'll give you for it. Gee, thanks, Death. You always got my back. Of course. You wanted to feel to be friend of me. Love you long time. Aw, that's so sweet. But, bruh, we're on TED Talk. Gotta act tough and serious, man. Oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm Ted. I'm Death. And today, I'm gonna tell you why you should make me your best friend, too. Please give it up for Power. Wow, you came here prepared with your own applause track, and if we're doing this remotely since it's a pandemic, I owe you one, bro. Now, let me take it over. Death is terrifying, isn't it? I'm here today to let you in on my discovery to living a truthful life. A discovery told by a clinically depressed queer woman of color working in the music industry who's from an oppressed and corrupted third world country. Now, my discovery is when we're no longer afraid of death, that is when we'll truly live. And by overcoming the fears of death, you'll be able to achieve the three great rewards of life I call the three D's of death. Dominance, dream, and delight. Let's first start off with dominance. Now, death has exercised control over humanity for a really long time, and the entirety of our history is grieving, contemplating, and fighting death. Now, we are dominated by the idea of escaping death. From our DNA telling us to have sex, to reproduce so that we can live on a legacy, to the synology of cryonics, the freezing of humans severed body and head in a hope that resurrection may be possible in the future. Now, most of us fear death. But have you ever asked yourself, why? Is it the pain before death that we feared, or is it the fear of not knowing where we're going next? Now, the causes of this fear comes from two things, the lack of information and the lack of control. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. If we're going to go to hell, heaven, reincarnate, or is life actually all aligned with test subject in giant lab run by mad scientists? We have absolutely no control over death. Death is pretty much absolute. Now, it's inevitable that death will continue to dominate us physically, but we can be free from his mental dominance imposes upon us. Now, fear of the unknown hinders progress, just like how fear of death hinders personal growth. People have a perception of how things should be, how humans should look, think, act, feel, or even talk. Now, especially here in Asia, a collectivist society where individuality isn't as celebrated as the West, when we're all so uniform in the room, and you turn around, you see this, an exclamation mark lie about the top of your head, and for some people, that's a threat alert. Option one, run. Option two, eliminate. Option three, try to appreciate. Well, we're all so scared of something different. We're all so scared of something new. But it's always a new idea to advance a civilization and transform the world. Now, people with new ideas are always seen as crazy at first before they validate their ideas. See, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Lady Gaga. If they were to be dominated by the noise and negativity around them, there would be no iPhone, no Windows, no Chromatica. And on a smaller level, if I were to be dominated by the fear of not being liked by people just because of how I am, I would have never been invited here today to give you a talk right now. And by taking back dominance over the fear of death, you take back control of many things in your life, including your finances. Now, in Thailand, gambling is illegal. But what I'm going to tell you is, we gamble legally and righteously all the time. An example of gambling legally is buying a health insurance where you subscribe to a premium on a bet that you'll live longer. Now, here we are advancing on a subscription service that will help you cover up part of your medical bill if ever you fell ill under a category of sickness you bet on. 
An example of gambling righteously is buying a ticket to heaven sold by religious organization. Now, there's this one infamous cult in Thailand where they encourage their followers to donate millions and millions of fortune, guaranteeing them a spot in the promised land. And I'm not here telling you to drop your religion or to drop your health insurance because I got one too. But I'm here to point out the driving force behind our actions. For us to be aware that all of this is motivated by the fear of death and that if we're able to overcome this fear, we'll be more able to allocate our resources to something that could be more fruitful in our current lives. Now, by taking back dominance over death, we're set on a path to accomplishing the second deeds of death, our dreams. Now, discovering your true passion and dream requires great awareness. Let me tell you a story about my friend, Fabian who used to volunteer as a rescuer in France. Now, Fabien rescued people from all sorts of accidents, and many times when he arrived at the scene, the victim are near death. And he let me in on the top two questions that a near-death victim commonly ask. Have I done everything I wanted to? And did I do good? Now, the first question explores the realm of regret. It points out that we more often regret the things we haven't done than the things we have. Yet, most of us spend our lives avoiding what we really want, our passion, our true calling, our dreams. The second question explores the desire to do something greater than ourselves, something for others. Now, before the age of 25, I can never say that I was genuinely happy with my life. I was born in an upper middle class nuclear family, but was raised in a middle class, typical conservative Asian family by my single mom. Now, we were one among the many who got hit hard by the 1997 economic crisis of which left my dad bankrupt. And I can remember the difference between these two social status really well. So from having too many toys to play with, fancy birthday party in bougie hotel filled with adults I didn't know, to being sent to all kinds of extracurricular activities from sports to vocal, piano, guitar, where I discovered my passion at a very young age to being late on my tuition, not getting allowances, and getting my first unpaid internship as a debt collector. Now, money is a source of conflict for my now divorced parent. They claim to be lending, borrowing, investing, reinvesting in each other failed businesses. And I was their personal debt collector since I was that short to at the age of 20 where I graduated. And there's a bringing wire to think that being rich is a dream. Money will solve all my problem. If I'm rich, mom and dad wouldn't argue who's going to pay for my tuition, my allowances. And at the same time, there's also this voice from the baby boomer Asian parent. Music? Art? Is that even a job? Can you even make a living out of that? But I finally realized at the age of 25 that money is not the solution. Money is actually the problem. And that I was chasing somebody else's dream this whole time the dream to become a millionaire. And this awareness came as I was working on a business I was not passionate about, that I was half-assing my dream, music, yet hoping to find success, that I was believing in the voice to tell me I can't make a living out of it. And I believe in that more than I believe in myself. And this is the worst thing a human can possibly do to himself or herself, because believing in yourself is the first step to achieving whatever the hell you want in life because nobody is going to buy into your ideas if you don't first buy into it. Now, when we are aware of what our heart truly desires, we're able to set priorities for ourselves. We know what's important, we know what's not, we know what's needed, we know what's wanted. And we can begin to accomplish these essential and appreciate our lives within our lifetime than wishing for something else in the next. And here we are at our final deeds of death. Behold, ladies and gentlemen, in this section you have here a clinically depressing person teaching you how to be happy. Now, you might have thought that a serotonin or a dopamine expert would be way more qualified than I to give you a talk in this section, in which I think so too. But trust me, nobody is as desperate to find true happiness as the depressed. Now, one time on my trip to Hangzhou, China, I got a chance to converse with one of the most famous, richest, billionaire entrepreneur in the world at his mega conglomerate at a conference. Let me address him as Jay. I asked Jay, hey Jay, I met a lot of people like you in my life. P 
people that we look up to and want to be like, but I realized that none of them are ever happy. Can you please share with us a secret to happiness? Now Jay smiled faintly, and he took a long pause, waiting for the applause to end. He turned to me, he looked at me, and he pointed at me. You're right. Most successful people are not happy. They pretended to be. And if, and if I were given a chance to turn back time, I would make my company 80% smaller. He go on further, telling us that he loses relationship with friends, family, along the way building his business. He said it was like climbing up a mountain. Where you're at the base, there's friends, family, people you don't like, people that don't like you all together, laughing, crying, partying, fighting. But as you go higher, this journey is not for everybody, and you lose these people along the way. And the higher you go, the worse the visibility gets. There's clouds, rain, storm, fog. And once you reach the top and you look down, you realize that you can see nothing but clouds. And when you look to your left and you turn to your right, you realize that you're all alone. He concluded that happiness for him is having the time to sit down and play mahjong with his best friend, to drink long gin tea with his wife on a Sunday afternoon, or to have the time to attend his children parent-teacher conference at school, those of which he had already lost. Now what he said made me realize that happiness isn't something you acquire alone. Happiness happens when shared. And all at once, I decided to let go of my company. I lose my job. I lose my relationship with my then boyfriend. The only thing I gained was depression, a mental illness that could lead me to losing my life. And I had multiple suicidal thoughts. But this is when I decide to turn the table and make death my best friend for life. Walking side by side with death has taught me true happiness. And funny enough, when all you can think about is dying, you start assessing life. And this is when I ask myself the two questions that a near-death victim ask. Have I done everything I wanted to, and did I do good? I figured out the reason for my fall into depression, that I was torn between the reality and the dream of being this amazing artist, what I was told by the society to strive for, and what my heart, soul, and spirit really longs for. I always felt that my relationship with music is a one-sided love relationship. No matter how much I love music, music never loved me back. But I never realized that I was all talk, but not enough action. That I was blaming music when I was the one to blame. That I was victimizing myself when I was half-assing it all. And I didn't truly believe that I could make a career out of it. I never truly invested all I can, my blood, my sweat, my tear in it. Yet here I am in the corner, crying straight for eight hours a day, blaming all the external things for not being where she want to be in life, complaining how life isn't going her way. What a loser, I thought of myself. Have I done everything I wanted to? No, and now I wanted to die. Second question, did I do good? What have I done for the world? Now this question makes me contemplate and search for my true source of happiness. I've achieved great things in life. I excel in my academics and activities. I was a youth athlete. I got medal. I got awards. I graduated top of the class from the two best schools simultaneously on scholarship. Sounds amazing, right? I thought so too. But I was never truly happy about it. Why? Because the people I care about didn't seem to care. Now, my dad, whom I didn't live with, called me to congratulate me. But he was never there at my graduation. He was never there when I win award. He forgets my birthday. Now, my mom, whom I live with, never, ever complimented me even once in my life. There's nobody to celebrate my achievement with me. That's when I realized happiness is like a clap. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. One doesn't do you justice. You need at least two to make a sound. I'm not happy when I do good. I'm happy when I see that goodness made someone else happy. I'm happy when I'm able to create an impact that elevates other lives. This is my personal source of happiness. Now, ultimately, my answer to both questions was no. And if I were to die back then, it would have been all for nothing. 
And this is where I decide that I was going to gamble all the existing time I have left on this earth doing what I want. 100% believing in myself, 100% believing that I can make it, 100% believing in music. And I want my dream and my delight to be aligned. I want to write music that's able to elevate other lives, music for others. And here I am today making a music I call dystopian pop with sound and messages extract from my dark experiences, but with the purpose of transforming lives. And four years after investing everything I can, all my time, all my saving, I'm able to release two EP. And after thousands of emails exchanged, I'm able to get myself to Asia tour and a spot at Burning Man, where I later stumbled across a team of Grammy-nominated producer and writer, flew to Los Angeles, made an album with them, flew back to Asia, did another year of conference festival in search for the best record deal. And here I am today now signed with one of the three major labels in the world, Warner Music. And in the beginning of this year, I was awarded my first trophy from the NME magazine in the UK as one among the 100 essential emerging artists of 2021. Keeping death close to my heart has taught me to truly live. I regain my dominance over my life by overcoming my fears. And I now dare to act upon my dream, turning it into a reality. And any time I need, I can return to my fountain of delight because I have discovered the true source of my personal happiness. Make me your best friend, and you receive three great life reward of dominance, dream, and delight. My name is Pyra. Thank you.